Throughout human history, child prodigies have fascinated us. Youngsters who are wise beyond their years, or who exhibit extraordinary levels of skill or talent that adults could only dream of possessing. There's also something uniquely fascinating about children in positions of power, whether it's boy kings or teens who inherit whole regimes when the rest of their peers are still studying. In some cases, such children pay a high price for their genius. They often burn out or break down. Very rarely do they go on to achieve great things as an adult as well. But sometimes, they cope admirably with their talents or power, showing wisdom well beyond their years. So, from boy kings and pharaohs to young men who revolutionized music, math and warfare before they even turned 16, here we have 20 of the most notable teenagers in history. Number 1. Joan of Arc was just a teenage peasant girl, but she persuaded the king to let her lead his troops into battle. The Maid of Orleans, Joan of Arc was just 19 when she was burned alive in May 1431. By this point, however, she was a military veteran. Despite her young years, she was a fearsome soldier and a true leader. Indeed, the fact that grown men and seasoned warriors were willing to follow a teenage peasant girl into battle is testament to her bravery and charisma. To this day, Joan of Arc is a national heroine in France and proof that age is no barrier to courage. She was born into a peasant family in a small village in northeast France in 1412. As a young girl, Joan claims to have seen visions of Archangel Michael and several saints. They all instructed her to help France's deposed king, Charles VII, in his battle against the English. People believed that she was indeed receiving divine guidance and Joan slowly built up a following. Aged just 16, she convinced the king's followers to grant her an audience with the monarch. There, she accurately predicted that the French would be routed, against the odds, at the Battle of Rouvry. When this turned out to be true, Charles too believed the teen to be something special. Joan requested that she be allowed to lead the French army and break the siege of Orleans. With nothing to lose, the king agreed. Aged just 16 or 17, Joan, with her head shaved and dressed in male military gear, successfully lifted the siege after just nine days. Joan swiftly became a national hero. What's more, she transformed what was once a political war between two royal houses into a religious struggle. This inspired the French and the precocious teen enjoyed several more military victories before she was captured in May 1430. She was tried by the English and burned at the stake in May 1431. Joan was just 19 at the time of her death. Three decades later, Pope Calixtus III looked into her case and declared that she was a Catholic martyr. Then, in 1920, Joan of Arc was canonized as a saint. While historians remain divided on her abilities as a military leader, and while some elements of her story are often exaggerated or even simply made up, she remains a true French icon, and one of the most famous teenagers in history. Number 2. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart is possibly the ultimate child genius, writing his own operas and symphonies before he even hit his teens. The Austrian composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart is often held up as the ultimate child genius. And for good reason. He was a piano and violin virtuoso from an early age and famously penned his first composition at the age of just five. What's more, he was a genuine celebrity before he hit his teens, giving royal performances at the age of 12. Indeed, though he died at the age of 35, he fitted more into his short life than most people might manage in a century. Born Johannes Chrysostomus Wolfgangus Theophilus Mozart in the Austrian city of Salzburg in January 1756, his father was a violinist for the city. He was also a composer, albeit not a very successful one. The young Mozart first showed an interest in music while watching his elder sister take piano lessons at the family home. Before long, he was learning to play himself and his prodigious talent was evident straight away. According to some historians, he was composing pieces by the age of four or five. Along with his sister Nannery, he was soon traveling Europe and giving performances as a child genius. While on the road, he met J.S. Bach, 
gained a reputation as a musician of merit and even wrote his first symphony at the age of just eight. Financial success eluded him, however. At 17, Mozart settled down. He was employed as a court musician in his home city of Salzburg but soon grew tired of it. Instead, he devoted himself to composing. In all, he wrote more than 600 pieces of work, including operas and several symphonies. While celebrating the opening of one of his operas in Prague, he fell ill. Though he made it home, Mozart died in December 1791 at the age of just 35. Due to his financial circumstances, he was buried in a common, unmarked grave. He remains, however, probably the most famous and celebrated classical music composer of all time, with many of the works he wrote before the age of 16 performed regularly by the world's finest orchestras to this day. Number 3. Louis Braille didn't let a childhood accident get him down but instead was inspired to invent a whole new language while still in his teens. As a young boy, Louis Braille was playing in his father's workshop when he suffered a terrible accident. He was impaled in one eye and lost his sight in it. The eye also became infected and this spread to the other eye. Within a few days, he was completely blind, with no hope of regaining his sight. Since this was early 19th century France, it seemed likely that the young Louis would struggle through the rest of his life. However, he not only completed his education, he also invented a system of reading and writing that's used by blind people right around the world to this day. Born in a small town on the outskirts of Paris in January 1809, Braille was blind by the age of five. However, his parents did their best to give him a normal childhood. Using canes crafted by his father, he managed to explore his town and he excelled at school. Indeed, he was so bright that the local teacher and priests recommended that he study at the prestigious National Institute for Blind Youth in Paris. At the Paris school, Braille and the other students read using books designed by their teacher. However, these consisted of nothing more than raised lettering. They were costly to produce and reading them was a slow and frustrating process. Braille was soon determined to devise a better system. Inspired by a communication system used by the French army, he came up with his own system. The new method was completed by 1824, when Braille was just 15. Within a few years, he had published his work nationally, though his special system was not embraced until after his death. Braille spent most of the rest of his life perfecting the system he devised as a teenager. In 1854, two years after his death, his system was adopted by the National Institute for Blind Youth. After that, it spread rapidly through the French-speaking world and then through the wider world. While the technology used for producing Braille scripts may have evolved, the system used by blind people today remains largely unchanged from that devised by the innovative teen a century ago. Number 4 Tutankhamun ruled over Egypt from the age of nine, leading the ancient kingdom to war and transforming its religious beliefs. Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun, or King Tut, is probably the most famous child ruler of all time. He ascended to the throne of Egypt in the year 1333 BC when he was aged just nine or ten. He reigned as the absolute ruler of all of Egypt for nine years until his untimely death in 1323. Since he died without a male heir, his demise sparked a crisis of succession, one of the reasons we know so much about this one ruler, and the reason for his death remains a mystery to this day. What cannot be doubted, however, is that Tutankhamun was one of the most powerful teenagers who ever lived. Little is known about King Tut's early life, and only a little more is known about his years in power. It is known, for example, that, upon assuming control of Egypt, he married his half-sister, Anka Seneman. The couple tried to start a family, but both of their daughters were stillborn. However, historians are divided on the matter of whether King Tut was all-powerful or, due to his young age, relied on a close circle of advisors to rule. Either way, under him, Egyptian society changed significantly. Under Tutankhamun, the worship of the god Aten was brought to an end. Instead, Tut ordered his people to worship Amun instead. 
the Boy King oversaw numerous ambitious construction projects, mainly temples for the various gods and goddesses. Perhaps more importantly, he also worked hard to build bridges with Egypt's neighboring kingdoms, though he was also ready to use force against them. Indeed, Egypt fought numerous battles during his brief reign, even if Tutankhamun's physical weaknesses meant it's unlikely he went to war himself. Quite why Tut died before the age of 20 continues to be the source of much scholarly debate. Some argue that he died after a chariot accident, others maintain he was assassinated. Regardless, immediately after his death, Tutankhamun was venerated, and a cult grew up around him. His tomb, famously discovered in the 1920s, added to his legacy as one of Egypt's greatest rulers and one of the most important teenagers in world history. Number 5. Isabella II was a lazy, moody teenage girl who just happened to be the Queen of Spain. Queen Isabella II ascended to the throne of Spain when she was just an infant. She would rule for 36 years, even if during the first few of these, power lay in the hands of a regent. When she did finally assume full control of the country herself, she was still a teen and singularly unfit for the job. Indeed Isabella II's reign was one of unrest, intrigue and turmoil, and the whole of Spain undoubtedly breathed a sigh of relief when she finally abdicated. When King Ferdinand VII died in 1833, his daughter, Isabella assumed the crown. This was despite the fact that she was only a three-year-old child. From the very start, her status was fiercely contested. Her uncle, Don Carlos, believed he was the rightful heir to Ferdinand's crown and his followers, the Carlists, agreed. The dispute led to an all-out civil war that would drag on for seven bloody years. Through it all, Isabella enjoyed a pampered upbringing while her mother ruled in her place, and made herself extremely rich in the process. When Isabella turned 13, she was declared of age and assumed the full powers and responsibilities of the throne. According to most accounts, she was ill-educated, ignorant and, though cheerful, often lazy. Her marriage to the impotent hypochondriac Prince Francisco de Assis was a huge failure. Isabella took many lovers and rumors of her incompetence and infidelity spread throughout Spain and the rest of Europe. Nevertheless, with the support of the Spanish army, she held on to power for three decades. Eventually, the generals who were once loyal to her, including her favorite lover, abandoned her. In 1868 Isabella II abdicated the throne in favor of her son, himself still a teenager. She moved to France and lived in exile until her death in 1902. These days, her reign is seen as one of scandal, intrigue and decadence, with the teenage queen often pictured as vain, stupid, overweight and incapable of doing the job she inherited at such an early age. Number 6. Ivan the Terrible declared himself the emperor of all of Russia at the age of just 16, and he was just getting started. At the age of just 16, Ivan IV of Russia, better known as Ivan the Terrible, declared himself emperor or czar of all Russia. This meant that he wielded absolute power. And, despite being still a teen, he was not afraid to use it. Under him, Russia was transformed from an inward-looking medieval state into a true empire. This was despite the fact that Ivan was indeed as terrible as his moniker suggests, and his bad behavior started while he was still a young boy. Born in Moscow in 1530, Ivan was just three years old when his father, Vasily III, died. In accordance with the deceased ruler's wishes, Ivan was named Grand Prince of Moscow and was destined to assume full power when he came of age. For a few years, Ivan's mother ruled as his regent. But then, when her son was just eight, she was murdered with poison. The regency was then swapped between different noble families, while young Ivan grew up. By all accounts, he was an intelligent yet cruel boy. For instance, while he would read widely and study hard, he would also throw dogs and cats from the palace walls to see them suffer. As he grew older, he would also find joy in raising peasant villages, attacking poor men and raping their women. At the age of 16, Ivan finally came of age. Rather than carrying on the tradition of ruling as Grand Duke of Moscow, 
he declared himself the Tsar of all of Russia, fashioning himself after the Caesars of ancient Rome. From the start, he was ruthless in keeping his rivals down. His cruelty was infamous. Enemies, real of imagined, would be hung, boiled alive or fed to packs of dogs. Obviously, it worked. When he died in 1584 at the age of 53, it was from banging his head on a stone floor, after falling off a chair rather than being assassinated. According to most historians' assessments, Ivan never really matured as a leader after assuming total power while still a teenager. His economic policies almost ruined Russia, while his aggressive foreign policies cost countless lives. Today, however, some Russians still admire him, and some have even suggested he was not only a fine leader but also a saint. Number 7. Alexander the Great had already set up his own colony, and named a city after himself by the time he hit 16. When King Philip II of Macedon died in 336 BC, his son Alexander inherited the throne. The new ruler was just 20. However, by that age he had already proven himself ambitious, as well as a wily political operator and a skilled military commander. In fact, Alexander was already well on the way to becoming great by the time he turned 16. Without a doubt, he was one of the most remarkable teenagers in human history. Born in Pella, the ancient capital of Macedonia, in 356 BC, Alexander enjoyed the finest education imaginable. He was tutored by the philosopher Aristotle and also schooled in the art of war by his father's finest generals, at the age of 16 his classical education was over. Alexander was deemed ready to take control of his father's kingdom. While Philip II waged war against Byzantium, his son was left in charge to rule at home. Far from keeping things steady, however, the teenager ruler took a more proactive approach. He crushed a Thracian uprising and then conquered their territory. He colonized it with Greece and even established a new city which he called appropriately enough, Alexandropolis. When Philip returned home and took a new wife, Alexander's status as heir came under threat. He left Macedon with his mother for a few months. However, he skillfully negotiated his way back and, within six months, he was back where he belonged. So when Philip was assassinated at a family wedding, Alexander was ready to assume control. He stepped up to the throne aged just twenty, and the rest is history. He would go on to conquer almost all of the known world, establishing dozens of new cities, revolutionizing warfare and spreading Greek culture throughout large parts of Asia. Number 8. Barbara Rose Johns led a student strike in 1954, a landmark event in the civil rights movement in the United States. In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal public schools, that is, schools where pupils of different colors were kept apart, were unconstitutional. This was a landmark moment in the civil rights movement and a major victory for campaigners for equality. And few activists played a greater role than that played by Barbara Rose John Powell. She was just a teenager when she joined the struggle and 16 when she led a student strike for equal education at her Virginia school. Not for nothing is she cited as one of the bravest and most notable figures in the whole history of the American Civil Rights Movement. Johns was born in New York City in 1935. Her uncle was Vernon Johns, a prominent figure in the Civil Rights Movement. He inspired his young niece to study black history and through him she developed a passion for equality. So when Johns realized that her all-black school in Farmville, Prince Edward County, had fewer resources than the whites-only school in the same town, she was determined to take action. In April 1951, she led a strike, having convinced her fellow students to join her in her affirmative action. The strike got the attention of the NAACP and the organization agreed to make it part of their wider struggle for full integration. Led by Johns, the students filed the Davis v. Prince Edward County case, which would form part of a bigger case brought before the Supreme Court. Since this was the only case in the larger initiative that was started by a student, 
many regard it as the starting point of the civil rights movement that would grow and grow during the 1950s and 1960s. As such, Johns, as a true pioneer, making an invaluable contribution to the movement for equality at the age of just 16. Johns was born in New York City in 1935. Her uncle was Vernon Johns, a prominent figure in the civil rights movement. He inspired his young niece to study black history and through him she developed a passion for equality. So when Johns realized that her all-black school in Farmville, Prince Edward County, had fewer resources than the whites-only school in the same town, she was determined to take action. In April 1951, she led a strike, having convinced her fellow students to join her in her affirmative action. The strike got the attention of the NAACP and the organization agreed to make it part of their wider struggle for full integration. Led by Johns, the students filed the Davis v. Prince Edward County case, which would form part of a bigger case brought before the Supreme Court. Since this was the only case in the larger initiative that was started by a student, many regard it as the starting point of the civil rights movement that would grow and grow during the 1950s and 1960s. As such, Johns, as a true pioneer, making an invaluable contribution to the movement for equality at the age of just 16. Number 9. Willie Johnston was not even 14 when he won the Medal of Honor for his bravery during the American Civil War. William H. Johnson was not old enough to carry a gun, since he was not yet 14 years old when he saw action in the American Civil War. He was a drummer boy. His job was to keep playing his drum, keeping the Union Army troops in check and communicating commands across the chaotic battlefield no matter what, and he did just this. Indeed, he did it in the face of such adversity that Johnston was awarded the Medal of Honor at the age of just 13, making him the youngest ever recipient of America's highest and most prestigious military decoration. Johnston's act of supreme bravery occurred during the seven-day battles of the Peninsula Campaign. He was a drummer boy for D Company of the 3rd Vermont Infantry, the same company his father had enlisted in. According to the records, he signed up when he was just 11 and no more than 5 feet tall, and as the Civil War unfolded, he saw action at Eltham's Landing and the Battle of Williamsburg. Then, on June 28, 1862, D Company became involved in a skirmish at the Battle of Savages Station. It was, all the history books agree, a rout. Around one in six Union soldiers were killed or wounded. Many dropped their guns and fled. But Johnston kept on drumming his orders. When D Company reconvened on the parade ground one week later, Johnston was the only drummer still with his drum. According to legend, President Abraham Lincoln was present that day on the parade ground and learned of the drummer boy's bravery. True or not, Secretary of War Edwin B. Stanton certainly heard all about it and it was he who approved the Medal of Honor citation. Johnston was only the second person to win the award and remains the youngest ever recipient. Johnston saw out the rest of the war serving as a nurse. That was the end of his military career. The records show he tried, and failed, to get into the West Point Military Academy. After that, relatively little is known about his life. He moved to Massachusetts and raised a family. It's believed he died in 1941 at the grand old age of 95, though the exact details of his death, as well as his resting place, remain unconfirmed. Number 10. Blaise Pascal taught himself math as a young boy and then went on to invent the world's earliest calculator at the age of just 15. When Blaise Pascal was a young boy, his tax collector father banned him from studying mathematics. A keen mathematician himself, Etienne Pascal believed that, if his son started learning about numbers, he would love them so much that he wouldn't be able to focus on learning Latin and Greek. Of course this only made young Pascal even more curious. He would study math on his own and in private. He even started to work out geometry, giving his own names to terms and concepts. When his father found out about his secret studies, he couldn't stay mad for long. After all, his young son was quite obviously a genius. At the age of 12, then, 
Pascal Jr. would accompany his father to lectures and seminars at the local mathematical institute. As well as learning from his elders, the precocious boy also worked on theories of his own. At the age of 16, he published a significant treatise on the subject of projective geometry. The paper had a huge impact within the academic community, both in France and throughout Europe. That its author was largely self taught and still a teenager made it all the more remarkable. Alongside his interest in geometry, Pascal also worked on developing a calculating machine. He hoped that such a device would help his father in his work. During his teenage years, it's believed he built as many as 50 prototypes, some of which came to be known as Pascal's calculators. Though simple, they were nevertheless effective and the Frenchman is credited with being one of the first inventors of the mechanical calculator. After his 18th birthday, Pascal's creativity and genius started to wane. He struggled with ill health and then devoted much of his 20s and 30s to studying theology and philosophy. Pascal died in August 1622 at the age of just 39. However, the pioneering work he carried out while still a teenager ensured that he will always be remembered as one of the most important mathematicians that ever lived.